okay uh, so thank you very much at the outset i uh, thank uh, dr priya for uh, making all effort and uh, Uh, Dr. Meera Velaidam, uh, for uh, who is the uh, coordinator for the Southern uh, Committee of IWS, uh, for all uh, the effort to make this event happen today. Mm, actually, uh, she is not well. Uh, she should be here uh, to do this on behalf of <coughs> Meera. I am doing it, and uh, I am happy that uh, this program is also collaboratively done with Tamil Nadu Science Forum, a popular uh, uh, an organization which is involved in. uh popularization of science for a long uh, very much connecting with the uh, grassroots uh, you will always enjoy when you go to tnsf uh, sitting with the people who are very much drawn from the grassroots and uh, drawing their experiences coming and making it as a theory uh, form you could uh, hear me some voice is coming yes yes all fine all you could fine. hear yes and um, i also thank uh, the dr priya hasan for uh, all her effort so we have a panel uh, uh, of uh, uh, different uh, states representing i am happy to welcome all so first i'll do the welcome and then uh, move on to um, say about a few words uh, about uh, iws so we have uh, the galaxy of uh, experts uh, drawn from different field from different states uh, uh, who will be the speakers who are uh, uh, very much uh, uh, contributing in their respective fields so uh, first and uh, foremost i invite and welcome dr priya hasan uh, who made uh, all the arrangements uh, uh, delivering the thematic address this is from maulana azad urdu national university and uh, dr mohana uh, from um, she is originally the um, professor retired uh, from chemistry in and in uh, colleges here uh, <coughs> arts and science college palnandavar arts and science college which belongs to hindu endowment uh, here in tamil nadu and uh, right from the beginning she used to work only uh, uh, majorly with the nsf and she is going to uh, deliver the inaugural address i welcome you ma'am for uh, uh, inaugurating this program uh, and uh, the session will be chaired by uh, the, there is a panelist and pa panel session will be chaired by dr chitra kanabran uh, from lv prasad I, uh, institute uh, hyderabad uh, and i do have uh, their profile Uh, maybe when uh, we invite uh, we will uh, introduce also uh, so we i welcome all the panelists professor rita john university of madras who is the professor and head department of uh, theoretical physics uh, and uh, in addition she is the director of the international center the chairperson of the icc and uh, several other capacities is there and uh, professor mani from indian uh, statistical institute and uh, she has been um, a feminist scholar uh, <coughs> specialized in the areas of algebra and others that i will do later professor madhrima uh, who is uh, again from physics uh, from uh, central university of tamil nadu uh, iqsc director too uh, and we have dr rukmani associate professor department of biochemistry and molecular biology from pondicherry university and uh, of course we have uh, uh, anbu wakini to present to is a scientist independent researcher from ms ramanathan research foundation but uh, she is down with covid and she is not able to come so i welcome all the panelists on behalf of uh, uh, the tamil nadu science forum and the indian association for women studies southern committee and um, uh, we are going to uh, definitely uh, have this uh, day uh, very meaningful uh, with your sharing uh, i uh, Uh, I, i try to spend some five minutes on um, explaining what is uh, uh, or introducing what is uh, indian association for women studies and what are uh, uh, actual um, uh, work or activities that indian association for women studies is doing so indian association for women studies is uh, an organization founded way back in 82 1982 and uh, um, which aims to further women studies as an interdisciplinary academic uh, uh, field concerned with women feminism and uh, the politics of gender and also to further women studies perspectives in different disciplines within and beyond education institution that is one of the requirements or the very objectives of uh, the women studies and the aws is very much very in the beginning itself uh, uh, structured such that it is uh, continuously working for the past 40 years it is going to be 40 years this year it is 22 and we have had uh, several publications and last time 2017 we had the national conference in chennai 
Chennai, where the 35 years of ex um, uh, IWS experience was very much published. And uh, it is uh, managed by the elected uh, executive committee and members include uh, people from academician, academic, academia, research, students, activists, social workers, etc. It's a combination of both movement people and the academic uh, people. And in fact, the women's studies as an academic of, um, arm of women's uh, movement could figure in because of the kind of effort that IWS uh, is making or instrumental in introducing and uh, continuously um, uh, uh, pressurized EGC to initiate with the um, presence of uh, Professor Madhuri, uh, Madhuri Shah and also um, Professor Admaiti Desai later who introduced the capacity building for women managers in higher education. And uh, it will, uh, it is engaged in various activities. Uh, and so since 70s, when the Towards Equality Report was in, uh, 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 was about to uh, release the people who are, they are associated with that, thought that there is a need for uh, uh, an association. So it was uh, with the SNDT Women's University finding its research center, um, founding its research center in 74, followed by the Indian Council for Social Science Research in 70s and in the Indian uh, Social Studies Trust in 1974 with the pioneering initiative of these three. It was thought that there is a need to have an association and that is what it has emerged in 1982. And uh, it uh, does organize as conferences. Earlier it was early annual conferences, but now it is three years once. And the very important topics of interest would be made very, uh, very much required to be discussed, particularly uh, related to the issues of the women and the contemporary concerns, etc. And that way, the conference would be very, very significant. And uh, AWS do have uh, its uh, important publications, uh, both in the form of books and the report and uh, the newsletter also. Very uh, important uh, messages and the contributions, articles, etc., etc., would be uh, brought out there in the newsletter so that is continuously being now it is available on the website and uh, who those who are interested to become member and also uh, subscribe to this um, uh, read this newsletter also they can visit the uh, website www.iaws.org where you will get all, all uh, in, inputs even many articles uh, old uh, one etc were all also archive, archived and uh, uh, brought out there even very much refer back and uh, we have the regional committees uh, in the north northeast east west south so for the south we have the state is uh, headed by and uh, dr Mira Velaidam. and uh, we have a diverse group in the southern committee also some of them must be present here and uh, many many very issue based kind of researches are being taken up with the Ford Foundation, with the Oak Foundation, with the, and also we have got the separate funding there uh, to darken, to initiate women's studies, and uh, Oak is supporting. So there are other organizations which are supporting um, in sustaining the any kind of in, in the activities that the IWS is doing. And uh, you can uh, always be a member of this, uh, provided that you have the interest in the feminist thinking in the women's studies perspective and uh, continuously engaging uh, on the various issues influencing policies and uh, even for this women's study centers influencing ugc to release the grant and extend give, give extensions etc has also been done by iws and that kind of initiatives uh, very much uh, pay uh, for other uh, centers also to not only women's study centers others also get the extension so being a lobbying organization advocacy organization iws is uh, and got the 40 years of stay successfully uh, uh, working on the diverse issues concerning women and uh, uh, in towards uh, kind of diversity inclusion and uh, equity uh, in focus uh, so um, you can uh, you are invited to join this iws visit the iws uh, website also thank you very much i'll also introduce uh, when each speaker comes because uh, it will take more time and uh, uh, if I start introducing them also. So thank you. Now uh, over to Priya. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, welcome to everyone to our session today. Today our session is basically commemorating the United Nations International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And um, 
Uh, I congratulate IAWS for all the efforts they've been doing on women's studies. And today's session is specifically focused about women in STEM, women in science, rather gender in STEM is what we would, all, we would like to discuss to basically see what are the issues that people actually face, uh, the ones who are in, uh, in STEM, what are the issues that they face, and uh, how, how, to, how could we actually think of ways to uh, address these issues. So today what we are actually planning is there would be a panel of women in STEM who will talk about it. Now uh, we all know very well that there is clearly a big gender imbalance in sciences. That is the number of women seeing doing science is much, much lesser than that doing um, than, than men. I specifically am an astronomer, so I believe, belong to the field of physics and specifically in physics, mathematics, astronomy. These are subjects where you clearly see a lack of, of women. I've often gone to conferences or meetings where maybe I'm the only speaker or there are barely one or two other women other than me. And other than that, essentially, the whole meeting or this, the whole set of speakers are all men. And uh, the problem lies at various levels. The problem lies, first of all, at the level of initiation in the sense of because of society stereotypes. You do have lesser number of women getting into STEM or into sciences. Like I said, because of the social stereotypes where girls are kind of guided by their parents, by their families, by their teachers, by society to pick up, uh, to pick up careers which are non-STEM careers because they are considered the careers which are, would be suitable for women in terms of their commitments, in terms of their time, as well as in terms of their capacities. Then there's also a problem about later on where women, you do have a big bunch of women who go in for bachelors or masters or even PhDs in sciences. But then the problem is about retention because typically when women finish their masters or their PhDs in sciences, that's exactly the time when women generally start off their families, they start having children. And then once the responsibility of children comes in, then the woman often has to choose between career and child. And many women then choose on children and family. And that's when uh, you know the career gets sidetracked. And then later on, even if the woman wants to get back onto their career, it becomes very difficult because she's already lost a good five or 10 years on childbearing and you know bringing up children, due to which a woman finds it difficult to get back into mainstream science or the career they were into. And then even if a small fraction of women actually manage to get back into science or get jobs in science, you still see that there's a big deficit of women at higher positions. So at director positions, at dean positions, at those kind of positions, again, you often feel there's a big lack of women, which is often called the leaky pipe problem. Because initially, when you begin, the number of PhD students is about equal in males and females. But then as you go up the ladder, up to become directors, deans, etc. Then you again, there's a fall of women and you do not have women. And therefore, there's a clear deficit of women, partially because of all these problems. Coupled with these, there could be problems of sexual harassment at work or some kind of a gender intolerance which women feel at work. There's also the issues of, um, you know, even there could be many organizations which do not give equal rights to women employees, do not give them um, recruitments, do not give them promotions well in time, like the way they give them to a male employee. And hence, there are actually this, this problem is not a very simple problem. It's quite a complex problem, which has to be addressed at many levels. So uh, while we try thinking of how can that be addressed, uh, there are different ways of addressing it. Like, um, like one of the ways I am the co-chair of the International Astronomical Union Women in Astronomy Working Group. And uh, one of the things which I've been very strongly ha trying to handle in that is about training and skill development in women, because often women do not have the required skills in coding, for example, uh, which are very essential in certain, in, especially in the field of astronomy. And therefore, we've been training women in, in coding skills, in data analysis and statistics in various softwares. Uh, but that is one of the approaches. Other than that, there are many uh, things in which work needs to be done. And that's why I'm looking forward to today's session, 
where we'd be hearing from a, a team of very experienced women who are working in STEM to actually see what do they think are the issues that women face and how could we actually think up schemes or ways of actually addressing these issues so that um, you know women do not have to face these. So I look forward to the session and I now hand it over to Dr. Chitra Kannabiram to, uh, to chair the session and conduct the panel. Thanks a lot. Chitra ma'am. Chitra ma'am, you are I'm unmuting. You need to be unmuted. We can't hear you. Please unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, all good. Okay. So, so I just wanted to say, I started off uh, by saying um, thank you and, you know, the whole idea of this panel and uh, the reason for its taking off today was uh, what uh, was initiated by you, Priya Hassan, and also uh, Mira, Mira Mirabella, I don't know, who actually put me into this uh, whole uh, event today. Uh, and uh, so what I would do without much uh, further delay is to call upon the panelists. So we have a uh, uh, few very eminent uh, women scientists here today who are going to talk about their experiences. And uh, so may I just straight away uh, uh, request from Sarita John uh, I think everybody has been introduced already. So, Rita John is professor and head of uh, Department of Theoretical Physics in Chennai. Uh, and among between all the panelists, we have people covering uh, different areas of science. So, we have physical sciences, biology, uh, and so on, and also from the grassroots movements, physical science movements. Uh, so, may I ask Professor Rita John uh, to. to I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Mohana to uh, inaugural address, no? Dr. Mohana should. Uh... I think first inaugural address and then panel. Okay, Dr. Mohana. Okay, Dr. Mohana. Yeah. yeah. So we will pass the uh, podium on to Dr. Mohana. Uh, this is, yeah. And then uh, the panel. Yeah. Dr. Mohana. Chitra ma'am, can I, can I speak? Sure, sure, please. And uh, yes, yes, yes. is this Dr. Mohana? Okay. Yes, yes, Mohana. Uh, yes, please do, please. Yes. You know, that was, yeah, that was, yeah. I, I expected, like, I'm sorry about the oversight, okay. but uh, okay, okay. just confusion in the program in my mind. So please go ahead. Yeah, you're supposed to speak before the panel. Yeah, please. Okay. okay. Good evening to everybody. Since I am in travel, I'm um, uh, cutting my video and only the audio will be in for you. Once again, good evening to everybody in this session. Dear President, Dr. Mani Meghalai, and uh, who mentioned about the, the welcome to everybody and the introduction to all. Uh, uh, I think we have a very brief presidential speech. Then, uh, Priya, uh, who is coordinating this program. I am really, I felt happy about that. Uh, the Indian Association of Women's Studies is being uh, uh, your, your old association of 40 years. But we recently joined it. So, Tamil Nadu Science Forum also coordinating and joined with this science uh, one science moment and also for the you know, International Association of Women's Studies. So here, today is the international, seventh international day of women and girls in science of United Nations. Today is they are celebrating it in the virtual meeting in New York. That is more important. The same day we are also conducting is this, this uh, science and gender issues on the basis of the equality. So the science discrimination and social discrimination and gender discrimination 
Christian and the woman. So both on the all the ways we are feeling about it. So that uh, I just uh, greet everybody who is participating in this webinar. Uh, I know very few members personally. So the panelist um, proceeding say Dr. Chitra and uh, Meera and uh, Priya who is coordinating and Professor Mani and Madhurima and uh, Anbuvahini also uh, Dr. Amuda from Tamil Nadu Science Forum. So I'm just greeting everybody who is participating in this regard, taking their uh, taking the material into their brain and heart. I feel in such a way because this is more important in this because a lot of effort is being taken to conduct this webinar and also uh, how to gather this. But uh, luckily, we are uh, doing it uh, at the uh, online meeting so that. But what we feel about it is women and girls are not only being uh, segregated and neglected in science, in all the ways they are being segregated. Although we are being the uh, part and parcel of the world, without women, there is no reproduction. Without women, there is no production. Without women, we cannot think about the society. 50% of the population is women, but what about her future? From birth till death, she is being uh, discriminated in all the aspects. So, uh, the IAWS is taking a work taking on, it is a, a, a distributing to the world and also throughout the India also. So, we have to improve and put the effort regarding the women and girls. Uh, that is a here, they are, uh, their work not only being excluded from the society, but we, uh, it has been uh, neglected part everywhere we are going. So to improve our effort and put it in a good way, this work has been done that February 11th and uh, International Day of Women and Girls in Science has been taken in a very good way. What we feel is, this is not only a change, but uh, the, uh, this year, this being taken as, a, as an agent of change. Yeah, the motto of this uh, day, in the, uh, 2022 is equity, diversity, and inclusion, water unites us. So in different ways, we have to participate, we have to spread it like anything throughout the world. So our action will add a collective voices on the equality in science. What we feel is a gender gap is seen everywhere. That is persisted throughout the years, uh, not now from thousands of years ago, not from the beginning of the human race. Later, that is after the introduction of the agriculture, after the introduction of the uh, cultural activities, women have been kept uh, isolated and uh, given a minimum importance for them. But we should not allow this because we are having every right. Although we are having every right in the Indian constitution, article 14, but actually that is not happened in anywhere. We know uh, everything in all the places, she has been neglected. Previously, the Priya has also mentioned about it. Uh, she is being the, an astronomist. In Tamil Nadu Science Forum, I am the only person in woman Female astronomy person, I am the only person. Although astronomy is uh, that is secluded, no, not all are interested, and um, particularly to uh, a woman, uh, they are not participating, they are not interesting. Very few other, I am then 
Indumadi Dr. Indumadi from AMSC is uh, another uh, astronomist. And uh, Pondicherry and uh, Ms. Hamadi is another astronomy person. So very few countable uh, numbers are being uh, mentioned. They are involved in this. And there is a uh, possibility of the participating is also lesser. So a yeah, gap is seen everywhere. The discrimination in the STEM, as you know very well, science, technology, engineering, and mass. Now only we are taking that in our hand and spreading it. We are pushed to uh, into the field and uh, we have to enter and uh, we should step off in the ladder of the science up to the higher level also. So even though the women have the made anywhere in the progress, they are being neglected, they, they are being pulled down. This is the thing all over the world, whoever may be, whatever may be, whatever may be the department, whether it is a uh, law department, whether it is a police department, whether it is a science department, they are being seen as a female on the child producing machine then only. Because of that, uh, previously, a month ago, uh, State Bank of India has given an, a note and a um, um, circular to the uh, government and uh, carrying pregnant women should not be appointed there. Only after the delivery, the service can be taken. This was uh, proposed by the State Bank of India, but this was objected and commented very much all the uh, female organization, women organization, then they have to withdraw it. So gender equality, inequality is seen everywhere. So that is being the core issue in for UN also. So the gender equality and the empowerment of the women and girls must make a crucial role and contribution, not only to the economic development of the world, but to progress the, across all over the girls that targets should be taken into 2020. This is the agenda for um, sustainable development for uh, science among girls and also women. Now we are searching for the any scientists who are having their progressive thinking throughout the uh, South India and the college, even in our organization also we are searching for that. Coming, coming out also. So uh, here only 33% of the women are being interested in the science. They are uh, doing the research. They are being the scientists in the world. Or when we are going to the artificial intelligence, only one fifth of the professors are being the women. And uh, even the uh, fourth industrial evolution and also the computing, 28% of being the, uh, the engineering person, 40% are the computer science. So wherever we are going, I just, I have appeared and uh, audacious reader too. I will, uh, for the past uh, 10 years, I am going in the back through the history, but most of the women scientists are being neglected. One, the, the first woman um, practitioner was Mary Tao. She was the mathematician, she was the uh, astronomer, and she has been crucially killed by the others, and especially the regional persons. Uh, you know about Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace is a, uh, he is a, she is a uh, uh, software programmer and uh, she made everything and for the computer science. Although on the Sarlas Fabes was being recognized on the person who is giving the software, the computer science, a uh, computer was not recognized at that time in 1835. 1852, she was uh, she died due to cancer. But uh, only after 2009, now she has been recommended. 
the language of the computer is a Ada language. Then only it is being, uh, they are being uh, uh, the promoted and uh, her name is given to everywhere. Likewise, the, um, uh, Williamina Fleming, she told that uh, oxygen, uh, sorry, hydrogen is in the sun, but uh, others rejected. Now, after a few years, the other when male scientists uh, mentioned about it, they are um, the element in the sun or the sun. Everywhere there, you know, you know about the Mary Curie. She was rejected. Uh, likewise, so many persons have been rejected. Uh, the atomic fission theory, the atomic fission theory that lies made near who proposed the word and mentioned the word fission atomic fission. Although uh, the Dalton told atom cannot be broken, she only initiated it. She worked at the water hole for 30 years. Being a man, a female person, being a woman, she was rejected to sit in the chair. She was rejected to sit along with him that she has to go to next seat even for a toilet too. She was proposed for the Nobel Prize, 1940. And she discovered the element protonium. That was not recognized. Later it was recognized. Her name was proposed and recommended for Nobel for um, 19 times for physics. and. 29 times for chemistry, but at no time she was given Nobel Prize. But 1962, her name was proposed to give it the, to, to take the Nobel Medal and distribute it to the Nobel Laureate. She was called later after her death in 1968. Uh, the, my element which was uh, uh, discovered Mycenium. Later, everywhere her name was mentioned. So, how much the women are being discriminated, even in science, even in truth, even in finding material, even in the invention discoveries also. So, from the past till today, she has been neglected in so many ways. Uh, likewise, the person who is uh, who worked and supported by. Uh, uh, supported by uh, um, Einstein, that is uh, Amelie Noider. Noider theory, uh, in mass, everybody knows about the Noider theorem, but nobody knows about the Amelie Noider. She has been driven out from the, uh, by Hitler, and she came to America with the welcome of uh, Albert Einstein, and uh, she worked there in the Princeton University and died there herself. So I had a, a panel of list of women scientists who were completely neglected by this society, by their fellow, by the way, male society, and later after that, after that death, their name was recommended in such a way. And it is a very pathetic thing, but uh, women are no way lesser than men in any anyway. She is having a competitive person. She is doing work all the worst. But uh, her uh, value is not measured properly. From morning to night, women are working in the family, but they are not recognized. But uh, contribution, they are in the only the, the, uh, uh, the politics and the government, the world is seen in the form of money, not in the form of value, values that uh, other material values are being neglected. So in that way, we are, I'm taking so much of time. So we have to put a step towards uh, taking the woman and keeping her in a good position and taking it to all the world and taking to the society to spread it throughout the world. So not only in the villages, but even in the uh, countries, even in the metropolitan cities. So women are being driven out by their colleagues and others. So 
we have to take a step and background to distribute the work of it. This mean the holistic approach, I think so. This is a, uh, this work is being the support on aligning the strategies on women taking the, in, uh, taking her in a good position and showing her capability and potential to, to the world and scientific society. So the progress is through the achievement and we will celebrate it in the, within few years. Um, at least we hope so. And uh, within the next 100 years, women will be completely placed and part and part of the world in the field of science. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, I have finished. Yeah. Yeah. Chitra, uh, Chitra, you can take over. Okay. Uh, yeah. I need a Priya number. I have to contact with you being in an uh, astronomy person. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Sure, ma'am. Sure. Okay. Uh, friends, we go on now to the panelists' uh, final discussion uh, on the topic that's been uh, mentioned, uh, and I think uh, which is gender in STEM, narratives on the field. And so what we are hoping is that we will hear about experiences of women scientists. Uh, and certainly our panelists come from a range of disciplines, as I had just mentioned, uh, from starting with physics to uh, biochemistry and uh, to uh, you know, agriculture and people science and movement. So uh, we would be actually hearing about their experiences. So let us go uh, straight to the panelists and uh, the first person that we will speak today is uh, Professor Vita John from the Department of Theoretical Physics, Chennai. Uh, can I start, uh, Madam? Uh, can I, uh, can, yes, can I please. start? Yes, yeah. please. You yeah. can start. Yes, madam. Yes. Thank you very much. So I would like to thank the organizers, especially uh, Dr. Manimekalai, my good friend, for inviting me to uh, be a part of this uh, panel and also share my own experience. Actually, it is uh, very essential that uh, some of us who have gone through uh, hurdles and who have come out of it are trying to uh, you know, so resolve certain issues uh, uh, concerning us and concerning others uh, to come together and share our experiences and uh, and uh, so I would like to congratulate you for this uh, thoughtfulness and um, coming straight to myself uh, so I am uh, I, I'm in the Department of uh, Theoretical Physics uh, uh, in the university, and I'm also a Fulbright Professor of uh, Texas University, and uh, I visit uh, uh, Texas universities uh, very often. And uh, why I mention this, I was uh, selected as a Fulbright Professor to teach solid state physics uh, in connection or in combination with uh, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, because that is uh, my area. And, uh, but when I went there, when I was introduced, a uh, couple of uh, women faculties were there because I was introduced in a common faculty meeting that uh, she is uh, from this. And uh, I was uh, given two, three minutes to talk about myself. And when I said, uh, one of my host scientists there said that she also is interested in women empowerment programs and she's involved in certain uh, uh, program of women managers, uh, UGC, and uh, perhaps some money making knows about it. And I was doing women and research and ICT integration in research and empowering women and creating awareness and helping them through these workshops. So when I was introduced to my surprise, some of them came and told me, you need to visit our department. So why I'm saying this, how women are there. I'm talking about Texas. And they said, I need to, we need to uh, talk to you and why don't you come? 
and see that is a very positive approach where i i still wonder do we have here and so they took me just four five of them there is also gap and then they were casually talking over coffee and then they said why don't you handle a few classes uh, uh, for gender studies i said gender studies i'm not an expert in gender studies i just do some programs along with my colleagues from different uh, places but they said no no you're very interesting we want to know you know the questions they were asking so it was a interactive session with the students the questions they asked were very thought provoking the first question few students asked me especially from china and korean origin they wanted to know how you people can have the same policy when there is so much of diversity in your country you talk about policy concerning women you just pass it to, and then you say this is what is the role and this is what is the policy this is what is the regulation but you have so much of gap even in the institution so in the cities in the urban in the semi urban that you talk about tribal women and you talk about uh, different cross sections in the communities how can you implement this and they asked me what is your role as women in seeing it, to, uh, see, to see to that justice is done for every bun other how do you create awareness to different cross sections of the society so there's so much of a difference in terms of education in terms of exposure in terms of experience and other very thought provoking question and the second thing they were more interested to know about the family constructs and then they were telling how as a scientist you are going to address certain issues and social problems and that gave me uh, an additional input when i came back i shared it with some of my friends so we need to think uh, very uh, for, uh, very much on this and uh, of course they also have similar problems so this is my first uh, experience and i hope now how do we take it forward but the second i'm also the chairperson of uh, women sexual harassment redressal committee of the university of dallas and we do come across certain problems i'm not saying very much problems are here but i hear i i i get calls from colleges and other places and uh, see as women we need to know the regulations so properly and then address the issues as pertaining to working in the lab and other things that's the second thing now i'm talking about women in administration women who are holding such responsible positions so now as uh, um, our experience i mean uh, uh, we all would have come across something related to this uh, how do we analyze in the first place how do we educate our women children when people are not sensitized how can we make sure that they get sensitized and this is a very a very important issue second place i have faced uh, um, issues and i have solved the issues also and thirdly how we can motivate women in different uh, uh, background to avail national fellowships so we come across the students uh, uh, with uh, a very good academic caliber but uh, who will not be able to take, uh, take up research maybe from under graduation is fine with them but post graduation itself is a question mark and coming to research and and really achieving something in research is a very big challenge for them now as a woman who have crossed those hurdles or by god's grace we didn't have that much difficulty in our society or in our families but still we know women who are very much suffering in this area are we aware of all this genocide to survive the government and how can we promote this among the children the girls today we are talking about international uh, uh, day of uh, women and girls in science and we are also talking about equality equity 
and then diversity, inclusion, and water, and so on and so forth. That's the title of the team given. But how do we apply to, how do we personalize it? How do we include ourselves when we talk about inclusiveness? Where is the inclusiveness? Now, I, I, I know I am given only 10 minutes of time, so it's an experience sharing my friend, uh, Dr. Manimekle said, so that's the reason I thought I would share some of these uh, uh, experiences with you. And then, uh, coming to inclusiveness, how do we involve ourselves in every single opportunity? So uh, in the uh, a panel some time back, I even mentioned uh, that when I was uh, given a chance to bring out uh, a Tamil Nadu textbook, uh, the plus one and plus two uh, physics textbook, I was the uh, chairperson and mentor. And uh, I have authored a few chapters also for them. Uh, but I wanted to talk about the challenges, uh, I mean, especially the opportunities. So after 12th, what the students in general, not only women, can do and after BSc, after MSc. So this is science. We are scientists in the first place. And so how do we promote our children, our students uh, in science? So uh, we, need to, uh, we need to expose them. So I thought I would give an exclusive two pages in the science textbook, school textbook on the uh, possibilities after or avenues after our uh, completion of school or college and uh, at job opportunities, research opportunities, research centers in the system, representing the system. And therefore I gave two pages. When uh, the IA is in charge of textbook on those days saw that he said everybody should do that and made it mandatory for all the textbook. Now I'm coming to inclusiveness. So when we go and do something, how best we can include the women concept over there, gender sensitization over there. And finally, when I brought out the final uh, volume, that is the 12th standard volume two, I managed to convince the authorities and included one page, which only physics had. That one page is gender initiation and STEM. So let me share the screen and uh, show you that. And then I will also talk about the government initiation in a minute. And then I will uh, give the platform for the next speaker. So let me just share this one so that you can also tell others. So now this is what is their textbook. So you can very well, uh, you can very well see this is uh, uh, the uh, gender sensitive. Sorry, I'm just a minute. Just a minute. Yeah. Yes. So this is Tamil Nadu government of Tamil Nadu higher secondary textbook, which is available in the text, uh, Tamil Nadu school education. And it's, this is what I have done. So my contribution, opportunities after. This is opportunity in science. We are scientists, or we are science teachers in the first place. So after finishing your 12th, you can, it's available in the net. And then I have also said, the research centers. So he talks about research facilities, famous research institutions for physics, because we always say the rural area children are not aware of it. It's also given in Tamil book. So we are giving them this information in the textbook itself and research areas in what are the areas of research and physics. Here, mind it, it is in the school textbook. And then only in every textbook, the zoology will talk about zoology, botany will talk about botany and so on, so forth. But only physics book, that's what I'm saying. When we are gender sensitized, when we are given opportunity, what we can do. So that is my contribution. Only physics textbook will have gender initiatives by government of India. So here I would have given this, you can see, Global STEM, we are talking about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, scholarships for Indian women in science. I don't know how many of us are aware of it. Society for Women uh, Engineers, the Google, I, I, mean, I don't have time to go through, but I have given the website for school children. 
to see this and how they can avail the scholarship, the criteria, and they can do that. This is for foreign scholarships. And I have also given uh, in the same uh, global uh, init uh, I mean, uh, gender initiative by the government of India. So this, uh, you, can, you can see this, the women scientist scheme by Department of Science and Technology with the website, and then Kiran, knowledge in a, a, a UGC, and with the website information. So this is available exclusively in the physics textbook. So the, the children, and I want uh, the learner, the colleagues over here to uh, inform people, they can very much download the book and see the first few pages to know the global scenario. It is in 12th standard textbook. And very quickly, let me just, uh, whatever it said uh, for, uh, our discussion quickly. I will take a minute and complete it. So, gender initiatives. Uh, let me share in a minute. Whatever is there, I want a very quick presentation. Just uh, running through the slide. I'm, you, you all know it. So, gender initiatives. You know, I take this to my student. I, I, I we as the HODs, and I'm also chairperson for postgraduation, and I have uh, uh, introduced a soft skill course, of course, holistic development of a, a scientist. That is the title of the course. There, I have said gender, uh, gender sensitization and gender initiatives. So uh, in the curriculum, I have included gender study in my syllabus for physics students in the elective course. It's a holistic development of a scientist where I talk about journal indexing, journal identification, publication, writing, review, review writing, and uh, e content development, and, uh, uh, and editing, and, uh, and videography. These are the skill for holistic development of scientists. Of course, presentation skills really. Professor Rita John, I think yeah. time is running out. Yeah. So I, I just have a minute, I will finish. So the, this, uh, this sensitization and gender studies is there in the physics education. So since Dr. Manimegle asked me to share the experience, I want to tell you the boys are receiving it very well and it is done in the University of Madras. It's a, it's a two credit course we are offering in the department. So this is women scientist team A, B and C for our own self and for the uh, society and training. And then we have postdoctoral fellowship that is by UGC. So that you can take and uh, current fellowship. And this is also for uh, a movement in this current fellowship and then Inspire Fellowship and all the other uh, things are also possible. And you can visit UGC and the website of DST and say gender initiatives, you will be able to see. And with this, I think uh, uh, I, I'm done. I just wanted to share my experience and what I could do within my small domain of influence. Thank you so much. Thanks over to the chairperson. Thank you, Professor Rita, uh, for a very interesting talk. Uh, I would now like, we have a discussion at the end for everybody. Uh, I would like to uh, request Professor A. Mari from the India Statistical Institute in Kolkata to give her talk. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I'll try to say a few words because this topic is uh, actually very huge and uh, I'll try to say a few words about different things. I have plenty of personal experience to speak about. I have also uh, participated in various initiatives and uh, there are many hot issues which need to be spoken about. So I'll try to say a few things uh, about all this. Uh, personally, of course, uh, uh, I'm pretty queer. I belong to the LGBTQ community. And uh, being an LGBTQ person in uh, STEM uh, uh, has its own issues. And uh, they matter for uh, 
all women do and uh, that's one thing and uh, but in my case uh, yeah i did face uh, some harassment uh, during even my phd period and also during uh, and uh, and occasionally uh, later on and that is despite uh, myself having uh, a very good uh, career and i have uh, plenty of reputation too and publications publications matter and i'm well known in the community and i also try to look into different initiatives related to that specifically when it comes to sexual harassment policies uh, adopted by indian universities they don't have much really for the lgbtq community they just uh, they just copied from the website of the government of india and uh, they just keep it as it is they don't bother about sensitization they don't bother about uh, related programs when you are adopting a sexual harassment policy if all stakeholders must be sensitized this is something which is never really done and this is the situation even in institutions like the indian statistical institute which is among the premier institutes in the country and uh, this is something which really has to be looked into and even the definitions need to be revised properly this is also not really done and so it remains it just applies to specific subclasses of women that's how it is and it specifically applies to cis women and uh, and uh, it sticks to the heteropatriarchal view of society and this is obviously very problematic and uh, so this is one aspect that has to be really looked into and uh, the policies have been improved by various other universities outside the country and this must be brought in properly and uh, uh, properly adjusted to the uh, current situation in the country and this is one thing which has to be looked into and the next thing that i want to speak about is uh, about sensitization which is uh, uh, yeah, almost uh, none of the universities really have a good sensitization for them this happens in some universities like uh, some universities and institutes but many lack uh, proper sensitization programs especially when it comes to lgbtq people and uh, and there have been i have heard about number of reports the group there are many groups of lgbtq uh, people uh, uh, in academia and say whatsapp and other forums and they speak of uh, immense amounts of harassment and uh, often they are closeted because of that and this is not really a good thing because if people are closeted they will uh, well, they will definitely underperform even in my situation that was the case say before my phd and all i was totally closeted and that really caused plenty of problems and uh, so that is one aspect which has to be really looked into while the, there's a trans bill it has too many shortcomings and these have been discussed by many communities i'm not going into all the fine details in this short talk but uh, i want to mention that and uh, so and uh, of course there are other aspects of uh, uh, feminism which of course apply to all women like uh, say things related to math anxiety and others those require uh, efforts uh, on part of teachers at all levels and that is uh, not much work has been done because there are not enough teacher trainers in the country there's a big gap in fact there are not enough teachers to teach other teachers so this problem uh, because of that say things like uh, math anxiety and uh, other issues are hardly addressed all over the country and uh, and because of that uh, women face more issues in uh, with maths and that applies to almost all disciplines because math is used by almost every other discipline 
And if somebody has too much of math anxiety, then they will try to avoid mathematics. And uh, this problem is uh, often seen in social scientists too. And so that connection should be definitely looked into. So that is one aspect, and that of course relates to gender. And there are many related studies, and if you want actual uh, 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 data on that, uh, I can share a few screenshots. Okay, let me share the screen. So this, uh, this is not exactly about math anxiety, but this is about uh, one of the most important surveys, which is about uh, measuring gender gap in STEM. There was a study by uh, on gender gap by, by uh, it was part of this project called the Global Gender Gap Project. And it was a three year project. And uh, it, in that project, uh, uh, practitioners from mathematics, computing, and natural science were all considered. And uh, plenty of patterns were noticed in that. And what it shows is that uh, shows that fewer than 30% of the world's researchers are women. And uh, apart from that, uh, uh, the and it is it has been confirmed from that data that the gap is very real across all regions, all disciplines, and development levels. There, are of course, individual uh, there are differences between disciplines. That is true. And, uh, and importantly, a quarter of women respondents across the sciences reported personally experiencing sexual harassment at school or work. And. Uh, it's also that women are over 14 times more likely than men to report being personally harassed. And uh, so these are some aspects I'm moving on. So yeah, for math anxiety, there are uh, then there's, there are not many recommendations on math anxiety in those recommendations, but uh, there be there's been a lot of work on math anxiety. Uh, over since 1900 or so and i can yeah this is how we define math anxiety it's a negative reaction to math and to mathematical situations it can be seen as a feeling that interferes with mathematical problem solving abilities of an individual in real life situation and that's how it is defined and there have been many studies and many ways of measuring them also and uh, yeah, and at least 20% of the population suffer from it. And um, of course, and, they, and women are more likely to suffer because of uh, because of the, the social context in which they have to perform. And there are many uh, related work. Yeah, and there's a big connection between gender and stereotypes. Studies on math anxiety in secondary and tertiary education nearly always find higher levels of math anxiety in girls than in boys. And this is confirmed by too many studies, actually. And, uh, okay, and of course, there are different aspects of math anxiety. And uh, it, the way different genders perform because it varies quite a bit, let's say in relation to numeric anxiety or test anxiety and other things. So I won't go into all the details here. So yeah, there's one nice cartoon which uh, says quite a bit about the situation, about the social situation. So I'll stop screen sharing. So next, I uh, yeah, have some more time. Next point which I want to make is, uh, let's say, yeah, about uh, software aspects. Because I have been part of the free software movement for a long time. 
say I was in the free software movement uh, since my college, uh, since after my college days itself. And uh, even there, uh, and if you want to know what free software is, I can uh, define it if you want. Uh, this free software is a software, okay, let's just say what it is. Free software is basically software that can be modified. You have, as, you have access to the code and you can do whatever with it and you can also make new software from it. And that, that way it is consistent with uh, knowledge. Generally knowledge should be free always. And uh, the idea of free software is that free software should as free as knowledge is supposed to be. And there's, there's, there has been a big movement since uh, the 1980s. And, uh, and in India, it, there's been plenty of progress too. And uh, we have uh, operating systems like Linux, with Blue Linux, and, uh, there, and plenty of free software has been made and it's part of almost every other phone available. For example, the Android in your phone is, uh, is actually a modified version of, it uses a modified version of the Linux kernel. And that is free software. You can get the code, you can modify it, you can do a lot of other things with it. And uh, in, even within the free software movement, uh, there is a gender gap, uh, and uh, which became quite pronounced. And uh, I was part of the activism to improve the situation. And uh, so you, I was uh, the coordinator of the uh, Linux user group in Kolkata. And there, uh, of course, I had to. I had to do quite a lot. I did quite a lot of things like uh, on gender sensitization, and later I became part of. Uh, I became the leader of Ubuntu Women, and there also I did, I had I did I took uh, plenty of initiatives related to improving the participation of women in free software. Specifically, we improved. Uh, the code of conduct. Specifically, I put the code of. I actually we improved because it's always done collectively, and we put the code of conduct uh, that's applicable to conferences and other situations. This is something which uh, not every other academic uh, institution has adopted in the country, and that is something which should be looked into. So. I can speak of other things too, like, uh, so that is one area in which I have done some work. And the other point which I want to make is, uh, okay. So yeah, these are some points. Uh, thank you. I think I'll stop here. Or do I have more? Yeah, Professor Mani, uh, I think your time is running out. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. That was an interesting. Unfortunately, we, we have to stick to our time limit, but we could have kept hearing more from you. Uh, thank you. And we'll go on to the next person. Uh, so, there it was the next panelist, Professor Madhurima from Department of Physics, a uh, member of Gender and Physics Working Group, to give her talk. Uh, good evening, and I hope I'm audible and you can see my screen. Yes. Thank you. Uh, at the outset, let me thank the organizers and specifically Professor Mani Megla for this opportunity to be sharing some uh, of my thoughts with all of you. Uh, thank you, Priya, and thank you, Shikta, for this. So, with greetings on this International Day of Women and Girls in Science, let me just move on quickly. One of the questions that I get asked very frequently uh, coming from a you know, subfield of physics where uh, I'm often the only woman in the group, which was uh, microwaves and soft matter. It's a very niche area. One question that I keep getting asked is, uh, why are you still talking about women in STEM and the glass ceiling and other such topics? And 2022, are we not done with this? Uh, for a long time, I personally lived in a bubble where I thought that issues didn't exist because maybe I had uh, my uh, family support and I was you know, in a slightly nourishing atmosphere where things were not too obvious to me that there were issues. It's only after, uh, you know, I moved pretty uh, high in my career that I saw the full impact of what uh, gender issues could be and how devastating it would be for the women who are concerned there. Uh, so I would say that because of a few reasons, the first is that women in physics as professionals 
Although there are, uh, you know, enough uh, equal number of boys and girls earning their uh, PhDs, women and men earning their PhDs, as professionals, we are still, home, you know, somewhere around the 16% mark, not enough at all. The second reason is that women carry the burden of cultural biases held against them, both explicit and implicit. Explicit being uh, the whole uh, familial pressure that we see our research scholars have on starting a family, getting married, whether they like it or not. And implicit are the various biases that we carry along with us, where uh, you know girls often don't see themselves as um, leadership material or as people who can have a well-defined career that they would like to stick to a certain place and that they don't have to move every time, uh, you know, every time the family moves. Unfortunately, what happens is often the rules that are framed uh, to so-called help the women progress in their careers end up being very detrimental to the very act. And I think this is one topic that we have been discussing and debating at a national level for quite long. Uh, things like uh, giving uh, the scholars, research scholars uh, uh, mobility options or uh, uh, childcare leave only for women, all of which go back and reinforce the gender stereotype instead of actually helping to remove these stereotypes. So we have a system that kind of works against the entire idea, although it's very, very well-meaning. And uh, this system being against them, I have personally experienced when I had to fight a personal case of mine because I realized that although it, things were pretty clear, there was a need to A, suppress the facts and B, kind of say that, look, everybody is kind of wrong and this and that. So you get to hear a lot of this. Now, with, I don't want to go into the details of my case, but today's newspaper carries an article about the Harvard University case, and it's the same. It's the same uh, problem that everybody faces. Uh, if when a woman stands up and says that, look, I have a problem, the system tries to protect itself and say that, no, your problem is smaller than the system. So we're going to first protect the system. And the system is typically the majority who are there. The sad part is often women, as we move up the ranks, we join the majority because we think we are entitled to be there. We have fought for it. So when you see your fellow women suffering, um, you tend to turn a blind eye. There are, in my own experience, women who treat their own female research scholars as just another set of hands, uh, you know, I, so that they can get their publications. Women who see other fellow women suffering and uh, you know choose to take sides which are politically um, correct for them, like you know which are career advantage for them, but not necessarily what is correct. So these are things where the system itself could be against any woman who's trying to move the head. And uh, I know these are taboo topics, but then I think we are here to discuss some of these. Now, women carry the burden of cultural bias is something that I said. Uh, the field of study for most girls in this country, unfortunately, is still determined by their family. The family tells you what to, uh, what subjects to take and you know how that would be helpful in running your family and your career where the family becomes the priority. Nothing wrong with that if it is the choice of the woman. Terribly wrong if the girl is not even allowed to explore her own emotions about what she feels uh, towards her learning, her career, and her life. Girls are more often told that they cannot be good at mathematics and science, and Professor Mani has just spoken eloquently about it. I'm not going to go on to it. But one particular instance that stays in my mind is when one of the students who was working with me for her project you know, she was very reluctant to work initially. And uh, after a lot of prodding, she opened up not to me, but to somebody else who came to uh, run a workshop for us and said that one of the faculty members, a male member, had told her parents, not her, that your girl is not good with maths or physics. There is no scope for her in the field. And this was in her second year of an integrated master's program. And that set her back so badly that she believed that statement to be true. And when she came to me, she worked on a project where she actually published work. I mean, she produced work 
which contradicted a very very established person's research paper and we wrote to this person and they agreed that our work was correct so somewhere unknowingly i think by being mute by standards we add to the woes of the young girls degrees and jobs are often a stop gap and this is something that i don't know how to tackle with the younger generation um, they don't even realize that uh, they are falling into that trap but it's always that they're doing a phd because you know and they're waiting to be married or something else nothing wrong again i mean i would i'm all for women starting their families early is the woman concerned the person who's making the decision is the only question that i'm asking uh, this was already mentioned by uh, i think dr mohna who talked about uh, the state bank's famous uh, statement which said that starting a family is a is the woman being temporarily unfit and i mean i think all of us had a hearty laugh over that the very subjects of science and engineering are themselves highly gendered and i think that's a topic for a much larger discussion how uh, you know an ideal engineer is uh, you know epitome of uh, ideal male so on and so forth that's not the concern for this particular talk so i'm not going to dwell in on uh, on that but the fact is that our we are already uh, discussing subjects which are highly gendered the way they are presented are highly gendered and this is something that we need to at least be aware of when we uh, teach uh, to our students now there are two options that are there in front of us we can either be proactive or be reactive and uh, i am glad that to a large extent the physics community in the country is being very very proactive the women here are being very proactive uh, first is uh, many of many of us are working towards uh, uh, encouraging young girls to explore and pursue science through various options um, and uh, also you know i personally believe that we have to be aware of our language i have uh, I'll, i'll just be taking another two minutes not too much Uh, i personally am very very careful about using this um, alice and bob like you know whenever you teach in my case relativity one male one female as an example and alternating between male and female because otherwise we have a tendency to say he all the time um help them overcome their internal biases and imposter syndrome where they feel they are unfit to be there and stand up for yourself and most importantly if you're old enough stand up for the younger women because there is a tendency to let go as we grow older and also i have this is something i'm beginning to feel very strongly of late speak up if you see women misusing the uh, you know little bit of uh, leeway that is given because some of them are really being detrimental to the progress of the other women so as far as uh, physics community is concerned um indian physics association has a gender and physics working group and that's the website where you can see and uh, there is the famous hyderabad charter which talks about what are the things that need to be done at universities to ensure gender equity in physics including child care centers and you know having equal representation and um, representation not selection in selection committee committees etc the vigyan vidyushi program which uh, picks young girls and talks to them and uh, of course both astronomy and high energy have uh, gender units and uh, astronomy is doing a great job with their anamani lectures but most importantly i think we need to get everybody on board including the men because men are a huge part of the bystander community that we need um, i only wish this panel had a male member to talk about their perspective personally i'm uh, i'm uh, 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 i think this is the last slide i mean i almost there uh this is a, a program that we are working on uh, program for training women scientists with vandana and deepa and then i work on the nasi outreach for women and children in the rural areas um helping with women study center in other central universities and also i strongly believe that we need to speak of gender and not just of women um women are not broken we don't need to be fixed but i think many of us do need the peer support so thank you Wonderful talk, ma'am. Slides so you. absorbed it. Excellent. Thank you.
Uh, I think you're on mute, Dr. Chitra. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chitra, you're on mute. Okay, uh, I, okay, I want to repeat myself. It's uh, been on mute. Uh, thanks uh, to Madhurima for that very uh, interesting uh, perspective that she has provided uh, on this topic. And I think we will move on right away to Dr. Rukmani, uh, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, madam. Uh, first of all, I also thank all the organizers, especially Professor uh, Mani Mekalai for giving me this opportunity. I'm just going to give the overall aspects of women in STEM. And we all know that, but anyway, I'm just going to uh, give you a gap. So we know that uh, many women have made significant contributions to the STEM, science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, Ada Lovelace it was pointed out by one of the common speaker, and she was the first computer programmer and Mary Curie. She discovered the radioactive material, Catherine Johnson. Actually, she was called the human computer. She helped in landing humans in the moon. And Rosalind Franklin, she helped us to understand the microstructures of DNA, RNA, and viruses. And Sally Wright was the first American astronaut and third woman to travel, woman to travel into the space. So these are like these are only a few examples. Hundreds of uh, women were the pioneers in most of the fields of science, uh, uh, science of STEM. <laughs> So I, I would also like to tell my experience here because I've been working in three different universities in South India, Hyderabad Central University, University of Madras, and also Pondicherry University. And I've been teaching uh, for 15 years. And throughout my years, I have seen that girl, ch uh, girl children, they do very well in biotechnology and uh, biochemistry compared to their uh, male counterparts. In 15 years, most of the time, 95% of the time, the girl children were the toppers in their PG courses. Okay, so uh, what's the global scenario now? As uh, the, uh, one of the speakers pointed out, uh, it, the, the thing is it's 20 to 25 percent. You know, globally, only 20 to 25 percent of the girl children are taking education and step. Uh, but India, the figure is a little encouraging, like 45 percent of the girl children, they enter the STEM education. What, what is disheartening is that the number of uh, people in the workforce, only 13% of the uh, women are in the STEM workforce. So was the reason we know it's a leaky pipeline, it was pointed out by Dr. Priya. And so if the 53% enter the bachelor, of course, they are encouraged. They are encouraged by the society. They are encouraged by the parents. So the scenario is like that. At present, they are encouraged and they are taking up the STEM courses. 53 are in UG and similar amount is in the PG. And of course, there is a little drop when it comes to PhD. But when it they, when they have to choose the research career, they are just a little afraid because you have to put a lot of time in research. And at first, only 13% end up in the workforce throughout their life you know, to continue their uh, uh, profession. So this is the real thing. So what is the big reason? So we have to find out where is the leakage and how can we try to seal that leakage? And you know, the reason is that we have a lot of responsibility. So they are loaded with over so much of responsibility. I just wanted to give two stories here uh, of my uh, good friend of mine. Like we studied together between sixth and also twelfth, and she is, I should say, like she she is an intelligent fellow and she's very dynamic. She has all the qualities of leadership. And after her plus two, she entered a uh, prestigious engineering college as a computer engineer. Mm -hmm. So, and she was a rank holder in the engineering, engineering also. She married to her colleague, and both of them got a very good job in MNC and they settled. Within three, four years, and she reached the top position, position in the MNC. And of course, she conceived for the first time, and with the support of the family and also extended family, she could manage. She could manage very well her profession. Uh, but what happened? Her husband got a very good position, VC position. Of course, VP position uh, in uh, an MNC in uh, Singapore. So she had to quit the job and go to Singapore. In Singapore also, because of her caliber, she could get a job. But then what happened? Her husband got a much better position in India again. So she had to quit the job and come back to India. Uh, so after, well, after coming here, she got conceived for the second time. And this time, because of the illness and also uh, age, the parents and uh, the extended family couldn't support her. So she had to leave the job and she's at home till today. So meaning like we have lost a gem. So we have lost a gem in the STEM workforce. So that's it. And so uh, and, uh, that is my uh, generation. 
And if I have to tell my students, two of them passed out from my uh, department, two of the PhD scholars, one girl and one boy, they got married. And naturally, I don't have to say the girl was much better than the boy. And the boy got a position in Texas m and and the girl got a position in uh, Buffalo University, US. And they were doing good until the first children. And the girl was able to manage until her first pregnancy with the support of others. But what happened slowly after, like during her second pregnancy, she couldn't manage and she had to quit the job and she is at home. What is saddening is that she says, now I don't think I will be able to go back to the workforce. Can you please recommend some data entry job which I can do from home? So this is again, she is a much potential candidate and she could able to find something very great if she is given an opportunity. But our societal pressures, this is what the trapping in domesticity is the main reason for lack of women workforce, especially good women workforce in the uh, STEM. And second thing is conforming to societal norms. This is again uh, one of my relatives. Uh, she is a doctorate uh, in uh, computer engineering and she managed to raise her first, second kid and all that. Now the second kid is six years old with only the caretakers and also helpers. Somehow she managed, but she had to get a kind of acquisition from of all the family members and also the neighbors, relatives, all, all of them will just compare her with the other lady. And they say, see, she is also educated and she has dedicated herself for the children and she is taking her children to trekking classes, karate class, and you are just leaving your children uh, with the with the caretaker. So this accusation and also these things go up, keep on, like, you know, it, it actually stresses, stress her up. And she was she maybe she is still continuing the job, but she keeps on saying like someday or the other, I just have to leave the job because I cannot get this kind of things from others. So the, the, the people want to show their identity, but it is not uh, really happening in the society. And of course, we know that uh, uh, elderly care, of course, anything which is at home, which it, the woman has to take care. If everything has to be proper. If something is not proper, uh, the blame will come to the woman. So they are loaded with a lot of responsibility. And one more thing is that safety at work is also a concern. Most of them, they, they cannot be in the line which they want to because of the safety at work. One of my friends who did a UG in biochemistry along with me, and she got married immediately after the UG. And so after marriage, uh, the in-laws allowed her to uh, continue the education, but she had a passion for biochemistry, but she was not allowed to pursue the career or the study in biochemistry because they said, uh, for in biochemistry, you may have to handle chemicals and pathogens, which is not good for your health. So do English literature. So she did English literature, but she always had a passion to do research uh, in biochemistry, which she couldn't do. And of course, some other harassment, as my previous speaker said, in the workplace also lead to the lead, that is uh, the withdrawal of the people from the workforce. So what is the solution? Uh, actually, we all know that it should be, we should have a multi-pronged approach, that women should be encouraged both in the domestic as well as in the professional spheres. So the parents, extended family, relatives, they should definitely help the women to continue their career. And professional support, if we take, like if we take government of India, as Madam uh, Rita Jones said, uh, so we have this Beti Bachao, Beti Padao part projects. And of course, there is also scholarships for women given, given under women's scientists scheme. And, uh, but if at all I have to talk about this, uh, one of my friends who did that postdoc in Florida International University, and she has more than 40 publications. When she came back from America, she got married, and immediately that she had to raise two children. Now it is more than 10 years, uh, almost like nine years since she, uh, uh, she, she was not in the line. So when she had to go back, normally any corporation won't accept with the uh, gap in the service. She was applying for this women's scientist scheme, and when she applied, only 10 to 12% of the applied candidates were given the scholarship. So if government do something to increase the number of scholarships, those people can be taken back to the workforce, which will be a great uh, uh, strength for the government of India. And of course, they have also established some working women hostels to uh, uh, help the uh, women workforce. Corporates, some of the corporates do, but the co corporates also, they have to take women friendly measures. This is the biggest problem here now in India with some of the corporates. Uh, the crutches for children is very, very important in the corporates. It is not there with most of the corporates. But here I want to stress that our Pondicherry University has a very good uh, child care center where we can leave even the three months old child and it will be safe. So we have perfect environment and perfect care for the children. So we work very happily here. Similarly, the crutches for children should be there in if almost all the corporate and study leave and comprehensive learning and development program should be given to the uh, uh, the, the research the women and child care leave should be enough especially in the corporates the Indian government is giving two years of child care leave 
for the uh, central government employees, almost like six to nine months of maternity leave was given for the uh, government employees. But these this kind of policies policies are not there in corporate. So similar has to be uh, similar policies have to be developed. And moreover, there should be some re-entry policies. If there Can is you please wind up. Yeah. yeah, there is a good, the, yeah, uh, one, one side piece, only one slide. Re-entry policies, it will be easy for them to come back to the workforce and especially if their seniority is preserved, then they can do a much better job. So uh, building the gap, uh, bridging the gap is not only for uh, everybody, it is for us, I guess, like we understand uh, the women's pressure more. So uh, we just have to change our behaviors and strategies and support our subordinate as a mother, mother-in-law, sister, sister-in-law, co-sister and neighbors and colleagues. So we should come forward to help them so that they continue their continue their uh, uh, workforce and then they, they can prove their identity. So which will be helpful for the uh, for the India. Okay, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and thank you for listening. Thanks, Rukmani. Uh, Chitra, I think you need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, thanks, Rukmani, uh, for your talk. Uh, and I would now call upon the uh, fifth panelist today, uh, that is uh, Anbu Varnari, who's a scientist at the MS Swaminathan Research Foundation. And in Tamil Nadu, sorry. Andhu Magini is not there. He's not there. Okay, sorry, she's not there. Anna's okay. got COVID and she is done well. Okay, uh, then the. Right. So, is there anybody? Now we can open it for discussion. Okay, so that was the last. Okay, I, I somehow realized that. Okay, I'm speaking of my speaker was. Come on, because she's joined us. Okay, so we have uh, the rest of the time now for discussion. Yeah. Yeah, whoever would like to speak, you can unmute yourself or raise your hand or whatever. Yeah, I just uh, want to talk to Madhrima. Uh, this is regarding, uh, I think it will go to other uh, panelists also to reflect. There are two uh, school of thought, schools of thought. One is, of course, uh, the special needs of the women must be um, recognized and provision should be made. And uh, at the same time, even Madhima was making point that if we keep on giving, like uh, considering the special needs and keep adding those uh, right from maternity leave to now it is menstrual health also. A bill has been uh, placed there by our own uh, uh, Tamil Nadu MP, um, Jodi Mani there in the parliament for menstrual leave also. So uh, the uh, sometime back here, uh, in the government uh, government Tamil Nadu that the women police need not be given the um, traffic uh, kind of or the bando was the kind of work during the visits of uh, or any function because uh, it's difficult for them to stay stand there for long without toilets so these kinds of things are there so we also reflect in a perspective gender perspective that if we keep on this uh, adding some kind of um, i mean having come to the field you have to adopt to uh, yourself uh, um, to accommodate. Uh, the special needs are there uh, specifically for childcare and other things, but not everywhere. So that what I want to say that it may uh, turn to detrimental to the very recruitment of the women itself. Yesterday we had a RUSA meeting in our university where it is a two ways project and uh, maternity leave is supposed to be given. Now it is nine months. So uh, the people were, uh, including the coordinator, etc., were discussing. We cannot. We have to go by the rule. Uh, but uh, if in the two years project, if a candidate goes for nine months, will the recruitment when in the process of the recruitment will the preference be given women for women? That itself is a question. So we have to see in that perspective uh, so the panel can reflect on. Nanma, I think there are two parts to your question. One is about uh, the toilets, which I think is a major issue which was uh, not addressed for a long time and needs a lot of our reflection. And the second is about uh, the rules themselves. With regard to toilets, I think this is an important uh, aspect. And uh, what is required is to ensure that there are enough number of toilets everywhere, gender neutral toilets. We are still stuck up on women and men. I mean, we are still talking about women's rights, but I think what we need to have are simple 
you know, unisex toilets that are accessible. And I think in the field of women's studies and sociology, it is well established that the public areas, the advertisements, uh, the entire uh, spectrum of it talks about women having the purchase power, that they are the ones who go and buy stuff. But none of these spaces have access to either toilets or to childcare. So the women is expected to spend the money, but, you know, doesn't have a place to go. These are well established. And I think at least at my university, I spent the first five years fighting for toilets. We had Western toilets when our uh, you know, students were uh, girls from rural areas. I have personally sat down. The boys helped me in making sketches to be put in every toilet on how to use a Western toilet, to teach the housekeeping, how to clean them, blah, blah, blah. But I think that is time well invested because that gives the girls who come there a sense of security that yes this place belongs to them we got sanitary napkin dispensers we got incinerators taught them how to use it did it affect my career of course it did i mean uh, i should have been publishing papers when i was doing all this but you have to do what you have to do so that is one part of it regarding the rules themselves at least as far as uh, i think the gender and physics uh, working group and the other gender groups of physics are concerned I, the thing we are talking about is instead of having two years childcare leave for a woman, can it be two year childcare leave for any government employee, male, female, other gender, doesn't matter who it is, or one year, whatever it is, or just care leave. Some of us might not be parents, but we might be forced to spend time giving care to somebody else, to a partner. So I think we need to start really reflecting on the rules because the moment you say that a woman has childcare leave, the family expects her to take that leave. I mean, I, I have colleagues who were, uh, both of them are faculty members and clearly uh, when there is an issue, it's like, you know, you have the leave, so you take it. In the longer run, obviously the lady is going to lose her career. So I think we need to address this at a much deeper level. Yeah, it is stereotyping. Like, uh, I'm critiquing the government uh, when we were saying that the police to be withdrawn instead of providing toilets, why they say that the, the women need not be given the work there. That is what I want to. I, I am very much uh, for that. The toilets are to be provided. But why the government says instead of providing the toilets, they are saying that the women can be withdrawn from that. That should, cannot be, no. Then the people will be resistant, resisting to uh, recruit women police. So that is the thing. Okay. Yeah. So uh, if you allow me, I can just talk on this uh, childcare leave, which uh, Professor Madhurima and also you have pointed out. Uh, this uh, two years of childcare leave is for like throughout your service. Like you can take it whenever you would like to, during the 10 standard exams, if you want to support your child, or during your plus two exams, if you want to support her, and if there is any illness for the child, so that time you can take it. And you still can take it because after six months, if you want to take care of your child, if you do not have any supporting system at home, uh, then you can take at that time. Maybe not exactly two years at a stretch, it can be taken at different gaps. So I think it is very well required because to work in peace, you want your children to be like uh, proper or, or the family to be uh, at a proper, uh, uh, what is right, uh, safety. So I think this is needed. Even maternity leave is needed because nowadays uh, the children which are raised before and now are different because of whatever the tablets they give or whatever, they are hyperactive. So you have to be with them and you have to be ensure their safety. So this kind of like care will help them to sustain or help the people to be there in the workforce for a longer time. So this is my view regarding the leave uh, and child care. Any other questions from any of the members present? Chitra, if there are no more questions, then you have your 10 minutes to wrap up. Okay, uh, okay I'm just waiting for a minute in case somebody uh, comes up from our yeah. program. Yeah. Participants, we have a few more than our panelists. I mean, we started with 12, but I think I see a few more in terms of number. 
Does anybody have any questions? Please uh, uh, come forward. No more questions. Okay, okay so uh, I think we had uh, different perspectives coming out from this panel. Uh, from our panelists who have actually uh, different areas of experience. Uh, we had Professor Rita John talking about the necessity for, uh, you know, the, the maybe students right back to the level of, you know, from a younger age being sensitive about gender issues and the, the problem of how to sensitize people to issues uh, and not just gender, but also in terms of diversity. So, you know, one needs to implement diversity across different realms uh, in, uh, in, in different departments uh, and gender sensitization would be a part of that. And she also highlighted a uh, brochure uh, from the government of Tamil Nadu which gives information about different aspects of research uh, such as opportunities and so on. And, uh, and basically requested that the book can be referred to. And it has also included uh, gender issues for physics students uh, then, of course, uh, some money from ISI in Calcutta has uh, talked particularly about the challenges to the LGBT community. I think this is an area which is not often talked about, and especially in science, it has certainly, uh, till now, it has a backseat compared to even social sciences and uh, humanities, I think. Uh, and apart from that, uh, she highlighted the findings from the gender gap study, uh, you know. so. It, it's kind of, uh, it fits into a pattern that we know uh, from different studies as well, where less than a third of researchers are women, and their experiences tend to be, uh, you know, not so positive uh, and not encouraging to them. And of course, you have issues of personal harassment and discrimination. And also, she referred to something called math anxiety, which I'm sure I have, uh, which is a difficulty with math and, uh, you know, and which affects your problem solving ability. Yeah, and then we had Dr. Madhurima uh, who talked, she basically talked about, uh, you know, this underrepresentation of women in physics, uh, you know, and there being a cultural bias uh, towards women. Uh, and often women are, you know, are made weaker or more entrenched in the patriarchal order by means of these rules, which are supposed to help or protect them. And uh, unfortunately, we all know this, but women are obviously subject to the same social and cultural values, but they tend to reinforce these values uh, that may work against them. Uh, and, and also she talked about the need to encourage girls to pursue science and overcome what we call as the imposter syndrome. And she's working in various programs for aspiring women scientists as well. Uh, and then we had Professor Rukumani, uh, who basically started by giving a list of different women scientists who have made very significant discoveries in their field. And talked about also the, the by now well-known and much talked about uh, leaky pipeline, was referred to leaky pipeline, which is a, a decrease or a, or a fall off in the number of women researchers, uh, you know, as they go along in their career. So early in the career, uh, right from college onwards to a PhD level, you have a good number of women, but then it goes down when they go to independent uh, positions, and this is because it's uh, very often done uh, in favor of their husband, whose job has to be protected. And the challenges, of course, are you know cultural and values in society, uh, responsibilities uh, due to marriage, care of elders, safety and harassment, and of course, uh, you know, so you know there are uh, different things that issues that need to be addressed to close this gap. And so the, you know, the various, uh, uh, across the spectrum, I think uh, various issues brought up with respect to challenges faced and also in different quarters and also the kinds of uh, uh, structures and, and changes that need to be put in place. Um, and uh, I think with that, uh, that's really all I have to say. And I would also like to add something about, you know, this whole question of gender in science has received a lot of attention recently and uh, basically, Apart from what was already mentioned in the beginning about the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, uh, you know, it is, uh, first of all, gender inequality is one of the, uh, uh, you know, attaining gender equity is one of the sustainable development goals of the UN. And so this problem is something that is to be taken up and, and it's something that uh, is to be taken up by all, all, all nations. And science, technology and innovation is something that cuts across 
different set, you know, of these uh, sustainable development goals, and it certainly has a cross cut uh, interaction with, uh, uh, you know, gender uh, inequality as well. So it's a, the number five goal. Number five is attaining gender equality. And uh, what we have now is a situation where there's a shortage of skills in certain technical areas, particularly mass computer science, artificial intelligence, and so on, um, which make up, which is part of the digital revolution or the fourth industrial revolution of this world. And uh, there is a need, therefore, for women to take up more positions in these areas and uh, be able to fill this gap in the demand. So there's a huge demand and there's a shortage of supply versus demand. So to fill in this gap, in fact, uh, women are being sought to enter these fields. And uh, so, you know, various bodies have come out with uh, all recommendations uh, to be brought in in relation to women in, in science uh, domains. For example, UNESCO has, uh, has brought out a report. Uh, in India, we have the National Institute of Advanced Studies, the Indian Academies of Science, that have brought out detailed reports giving the problems of women in science and also recommendations about what needs to be done. Some of the points that were discussed today were in fact also brought into their recommendations, like providing transportation, child care, and care of elderly, and so on, for both men and women scientists so that they get facilitated in uh, doing their research. And of course, I think a very key aspect of this, which particularly affects women, is what is uh, very, very important to move up the career ladder, uh, which is networking. And, uh, you know, in the collaborations and uh, building connections with other people uh, is something that is of very, very immense value in this uh, domain and which will help you to, again, you know, as again was mentioned by some of the panelists, help you to get other uh, responsibilities and other accolades, like, for example, awards and editorships and so on. Uh, so this is important. And I think in this connection, we have a 500 women scientists network, which is a volunteer uh, group of women in the U.S., which have created a database of women scientists uh, and, and they have many thousands of women so far. And so what this database is supposed to be for is that these women who are listed can be contacted. So they can be contacted for consultancy jobs, peer reviews for media issue, you know, media uh, endeavors, you know, for, for example, for uh, you know, publicizing events, panel discussions, education and so on. So that, you know, it's a network of women that can be contacted from the database and recruited to all these other areas uh, related to our science and technology, which will give them better participation and uh, more visibility as well. So that is something in terms of networking that has been set up. It's a platform of many thousands of women. And uh, I think that's, that's uh, a great idea, uh, actually. Uh, so really, that, that's all I have to say to add to what has been said. And I would like to thank uh, all the panelists uh, and of course, Priya Hassan was the one who sort of set the ball rolling here in our as far as this particular work is concerned. And uh, I would, of course, uh, also like to say that, uh, you know, we have had, you know, input from people uh, which, which led to uh, this particular uh, effort taking place and very good. And uh, for that, uh, you know, I think that the uh, was my you know, sort of came up with this idea of having a session here. Um, and so I'd like to thank all the panelists also. And Mira, I'd like to thank my friend Mira Vela. I think I mentioned her in the beginning, but she could not be here. But she was also one of the people who was instrumental in putting this event together and put me in the event uh, to, uh, more than everything. So thank you very much. And I think we can uh, close the session for today. And the vote of thanks will be given now by Professor Amunda. So good evening, one and all, and my proceed, ma'am. I'm Dr. Amuda. May I proceed? Sure. Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So uh, uh, it's indeed a, a privilege uh, for me to propose the vote of thanks. And obviously, it is one of the very fruitful message that we have shared with each other. I would like to quote. Uh, Simone de Bauer, as she was saying, is one born a woman or she become a woman? We still have the question. Every now and then you, me and everyone is being cautioned with the question, be a woman, beware you are a woman. 
i just don't understand what is the what is wrong to be a woman and it is everywhere a kind of training and taming a woman and we do have a session here to know about uh, women in stem absolutely like what madhurima was asking a question to us is it still relevant to put up a question but yes of course we do have a journey of a century back since we have been traveling and we are it to travel but still this question stick on to us it is a kind of you know uh, we need to ask each other why it is uh, it we spoke in very different dimensions many different terms of equality equal equality equity gender sensitization everything is been there but still but still the mindset of a woman to break the net shell and to explore herself is what is the best thing that will put up woman in a right place so uh, i i really thank the august gathering especially right from the welcome note professor yam uh, mani megale uh, who is the director and head department of women studies bharatidasan university uh, ma'am uh, bharatidasan university is very close to me because i have been there for the hrdc center and where i think your department is just adjacent to that building so you have been doing an excellent job thank you for organizing the the segment and this uh, excellent event thank you on behalf of the panel and the august gathering here ma'am thank you dr mani megale for proposing the welcome address and the thematic address uh, by one of the organizer dr priya hasini uh, uh, from molana azad university hyderabad it was so inspiring and you nailed with a certain point and you triggered and as a well began it was a very good listening from other participants too and of course uh the inaugural uh, speech by our own dr s mogana the former uh, state president of tamil nadu science forum science forum is where that you combine or you make a blending of science with activism and i could really listen to many scientists who uh, were here speaking on science it's not from the perspective of scientist but being an activist so woman being an activist as well as a scientist being in a learned podium is what is going to give us a hope for future thank you ma'am for the most inspiring inaugural speech and i would like to thank dr chitra kannabiran for for sharing the for chairing the session so very elegantly and taking it uh, very neatly thank you so much ma'am it was indeed uh, a pleasure listening to you and you have moderated the session so very well uh, and and she is from again from hyderabad thank you so much and uh, uh, dr professor rita john who rightly spoke about uh, the global scenario and other aspect who is from the university of madras we are so proud that there is a scholar over here who have uh, taken to the textbook of tamil nadu because that is what is more important our students our girls lack information they do not know what to do first of all because it has already been told to them how they are supposed to be but your information would be definitely valuable for our children especially the rural children to come up uh, in 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 stem not only in stem or in many more adventures to be in fourth and my sincere thanks to professor rita john who is been uh, 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 from the university of uh, Madra madras as i was saying and then i would like to thank uh, uh, professor mani who has been rightly talking about the gender gap it was so very interesting and very informative rather very encouraging and promising to listen to you professor mani thank you go ahead with your fantastic job i would like to thank uh, professor v madhuri and she was all forceful and full of energy as she was Uh, talking about uh, a sense or a trigger of a feminist fire was there in Madhuri's speech, as well as uh, the way she has put forth. You know, beyond everything, beyond talking about gender stereotyping, it is the question, or it is more important to talk about gender mainstreaming. That's what uh, uh, Madhuri Ma was doing. Uh, thank you, Professor, for talking on that. And as you said, stop gap. We will do that. right now and uh, dr rukmani was uh, too much concern about the social 
prejudices or the kind of a constraint and she rightly put up the challenges of course whatever you have been saying was absolutely right ma'am thank you for giving us an idea on how one has to come up facing the challenges thank you dr rukmani for a very enlightening speech and uh, last but not the least again i would like to doc, uh, uh, thank dr chitra for summing up so very well and giving us a kind of an idea how it was so uh, uh, as i was i would like to conclude by saying whatever gadget we are using it would be a pen or a pen drive or it would be a steering wheel in a car or it is going to be a yok in a airplane the device does not know who is using it it is simply that matters it is not a male or female it is a kind of how competent we are and how successful we are in our career so let us not still talk about the barriers let us fight our right and go ahead with empowerment uh, when we have a question of why there is no scientist in india especially women scientists i have a author aisha it's a novel written by nadarajan he rightly put up in the conclusion of this novel saying that why there is no women scientist in india go and search them in the hidden darkness of the kitchen we do have lakhs and lakhs of hidden scientists who have dumb themselves in the kitchen right in the next future at least in a decades time when we have a co common gathering like that as ma'am was talking about 500 scientists let us make it 5000 around about and that is going to be the challenge and that is going to be our success so once again i thank bharathiyasan university tamil nadu science forum and especially the indian association for women studies for organizing an excellent seminar to mark the international day of women and girl in science let us walk ahead thank you so much thank you very thank you, much yeah so thank you thank you yeah so i would like to thank again another vote of thanks to everybody who has participated in this uh, webinar and uh, our chair chitra as well as all the speakers all the channel, the panel speakers and everyone else so thank you very much and we'd also like to uh, this thing our thanks to meera who though she is not present with us over here but she's been actively involved in all the planning and essentially she was the guidance to all the planning so i'd like to thank meera also and chitra and everyone thanks a lot chitra you want to say something no i am done so i just want to again <laughs> we're doing rounds of thank yous here so i already said that uh, oh i can see is that meera uh, no 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 that's uh, that's morgana That's okay. more than so actually, uh, I'd, I'd be putting up the recording, and I'll share the recording with everyone so that uh, those who missed it can see it later. Oh, yeah. good. So, okay. So, I think we can close. Thank you, everybody. We are also at the end of the time slot. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Nice meeting you. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Thank you very much. Very nice, Kamuda. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am.